by coming into Swami's world, you can become a better person, regardless of what you've done. Gene Massey, a movie maker from Hollywood, California, has done a lot over the years. Regardless of what you, I was a bad boy. Before coming to Sai Baba, his personal behavior aside, Gene also had issues with his spiritual beliefs. I couldn't get over the fact of Swami being God. No matter, Sai Baba quickly singled Gene out, giving him everything. For a while, he made me his cameraman. I got to be close because I was the camera guy, so I got to stand up close where he was. He put me in the Shanti Bhavan, the place where the VIPs were and everything, so he treated me really good. But I crashed and burned. I lost everything. While living in Sai Baba's shadow, Gene's entire life fell apart. I lost my airplane. I had a houseboat over in Lake Havasu. I lost all my money. And three times I had a notice on my apartment door, pay the rent or get out. And I thought I was going to be homeless. So what to do with this devotee, Gene? What Swami had to do was make me into a beggar to the point where you're glad to have a biscuit. Uh, in order to cure me, he had to beat me down to nothing, to a beggar. At the same time, though, I went around the world. I went to 26 countries filming Psy schools, Psy service, Psy medical camps. So how does that work with a devotee who has everything and then loses it all? The combination of beating me down and showing me how to spend your money, it changed to me. So I am a product of his process. A process that can change you forever. The point is, you can't do that without it changing your heart. Because that kind of experience, that exchange of compassion, is what Swami's all about. Welcome to Soul Journeys. Also in this video, scenes from Sai Seva projects from around the world. Sai video projects done by Gene Massey. This particular home is catering uh, children and adults who are physically and mentally handicapped. This is an ongoing affair. We have been doing this for the last 13 years. We need a minimum of at least 25 devotees to do this service. But normally we get somewhere between 30 to 40 devotees turning up for this service. Gene Massey, welcome to Soul Journeys. Gene Massey is from Hollywood, California, and that's significant for more than a couple of reasons, as you'll find out later in this program. But welcome, Gene. It's great to see you. Thank you, Ted. I'm glad to be here. We've been fighting the good fight for a long time when the name is Sai Baba, you way before me. Uh, before I ask you about how you got started on his path, which is which is a huge story all by itself, what were you like as a kid? Were you raised in a religion? Did you have any feelings for it? I was raised as, a, as an Episcopal Christian, and I was an acolyte. I used to light the candles before the service with the thing, you know, I used to carry the cross down the aisle and I'm baptized as a Christian. What happened between the time you were an acolyte in the Episcopal Church? A good little I left the church. Yeah, I remember going to the church once when I was about nineteen, mm -hmm. and and my 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 father had told me to find a place to live. He told me he kicked me out of the house when I was seventeen, <laughs> and I was poor, no education, no training, no nothing. And I was struggling and I didn't have any, I didn't have a suit. And back then you wore a suit to church. I had wanted to know, I wanted to know what is God. I, I was actually looking for spirituality, God, um, you know, how, show me what God is. And, and uh, my next door neighbor knocked on my door one time in my apartment and said, I've got these books. Do you want them? And it was life and teachings of the masters of the far East. Hmm. And I was fascinated by it because they were materializing things and all kind of miracles. It was about a minister, a Christian minister that went to India in the late 1800s. And he wrote these books. Baird T. Spaulding was his name. Mm -hmm. And he wrote these books and I was fascinated by it. I said, that's really spirituality. They talked about how the, the, the power of God can come through you and everything. I was fascinated by it. They were doing miracles and stuff. And so, and then, and then I was a filmmaker and they were developing my film in a lab here in Hollywood. And 
the technician said, man, I got the weirdest film here you ever saw. I said, I said, what? He says, there's this guy in India and he's like materializing things out of thin air. You know, <laughs> I said, I got to see that. Cause I had just read these books about Indian materializations and stuff. I got to see that. He says, well, I can't let you see it. I can give you the number of the guy you want to call him. Fine. So I called up Dick Bach at the Hollywood Sci Center. Sure. And I said, uh, I hear about you got these films and I want to know what do you have to do to see it? He said, well, we show it every Friday night. I said, you do? He said, yeah, we have a meeting, a meeting. What kind of meeting? So well, we have budgets, budgets. What are budgets? And he said, and it sounded like a little cult thing, you know, and so I never went. <laughs> and then in 1980, Jenny Navarro, my friend Christopher Law, said, um, I've got a blind date for you. I said, I'm not interested in a blind date. He said, this is not the most beautiful girl you've ever seen in your entire life. I'll pay for dinner. I said, okay, I'll go. <laughs> so I knock on her door. And the door opens, and there's Jenny Navarro. To this day, the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life. She said, what do you want to do tonight? She said, why don't we go to the Sai Baba Center? <laughs> and I said, okay. I figured an hour wouldn't kill me. Wherever she's going, I'll be, I'll be willing to go. So I went to the Sai Baba Center, the old Hollywood Center, and I walked in and sat down. The men were on one side, the ladies were on one side, and there was something about the altar that was like this energy coming off the altar there's a picture there's a picture of, of Sai Baba up there a guy they're all these worshiping this guy that's not Jesus mm -hmm. oh my god <laughs> <laughs> so, and they started singing budgeons and I started sobbing like a baby really really didn't, you couldn't have understood a word didn't know never heard them before didn't never heard sanskrit budgeons or anything and they're singing janet box beautiful singer she's singing these budgeons and i'm sobbing and sobbing and sobbing and i couldn't get over it and then they never took up a collection they didn't pass a plate give us or give us your money they didn't try to sign me up they didn't take up a collection and they gave me a book which i took home and read and i loved what the book said it was swami's teachings you know and i I thought, well, this is all true, you know, this all this all rings true. Yeah. And the next day, Jenny Navarro went to India for six weeks. She was not interested in being my girlfriend. Uh huh. Mommy said that that we were going to be friends, you know. Uh, but I continued going, and it became kind of a routine for me. A Friday night, I would go there, and I liked it. You know, the incense smelled good, and they beautiful songs, and it kind of touched my heart and they were talking about the service projects that they were doing I thought, you know these are really really good people you know saturday they're going to go over and clean up an old lady's house because she's too too old to clean it up herself and they're feeding the poor downtown and i thought this is this is really this is for real i couldn't get over the fact of swami being god and I would have these dreams and I never saw his form in the dream. He would always be like around the side of the door or just around the door, you know, yeah. as, if, as if he was showing me as not his form, you know, but I, I felt his presence, and, but he would never appear in the dream. He would always like be behind the door or around the corner or something. It was very strange. <laughs> and uh, then in, uh, I started going to the center and I got, you know, I got going with him, you know, and, and stayed up all night one night for Sri Bratri. <laughs> Going around telling everybody, I stayed up all night for sheep country. <laughs> I, I'm still fascinated, Gene, by the fact that uh, you made your livelihood over all these years in the film industry, and you went to have a film developed, and the guy working there, the technician, apparently, uh, mentioned to you this, this wild and crazy film he saw from somebody else's camera, uh, and that was the spark that lit the bonfire of Sai Baba in your life. That's, a, that's an amazing story all by itself. Have you ever- Well, what's, what's really interesting was, was I finally went to, we finally went to, I finally went to India in January of 88 with the Hollywood Sci Center mm -hmm. and had an interview and, and uh, but what's really interesting was Swami said, you know, Gene's been a devotee um, this was in February 2000 when I went with my friend, when I got all those interviews, uh, my friend Carl said, Swami, Gene's been a devotee for, for uh, 20 years. And Swami said, no, 25. Oh. And I thought, <laughs> was that true? 
Well, what, what he meant was in 1975 was when he called me. I, I started going every couple of years from, from 88 until 2000. And then in 2000, Harshad Patel called me and said, would you like to make a film for Swami? I said, sure. And who is he? Harshad Patel is, is, a, is a, a man who is one of the greatest devotees that I've ever known. He and his family have a foundation and the entire family puts money into their they put all their salaries all their net worth everything goes into this foundation they built a school in navsari which i've made a film about and all they do is swami that's all they do and all of their resources all of their time and energy all of those in all those emails that you see coming out of the organization they're all being done by his son nilesh patel I mean, that's all they do, and, and he's a he's a, a great man. He he owns a motel, and yet he donated to build the hospital a large amount of money to build a hospital. Everybody, thought, we never knew Harshad was rich. Well, he's not rich. He owns a motel, but he gave everything that he owned to build the hospital, and so he's a he's a truly great man. And so when he called me. Uh, and at the time, he was a regional president. And when he called me, he said, do you want to go to India and make a film? And I said, of course. And it was a film about, it's the creation film that played in the museum for so many years. So about a million people, I think. The creation of the universe, according to the Vedas, and Swami's letter, the letter that starts, there was no one to know who I am. Mm -hmm. Remember that? I do. And so uh, I made that creation film and learned all about the Vedas. And it took me six months. And um, it was the hardest film ever made, but it was fascinating, a fascinating experience. And it played in the museum. And I had six interviews with Swami. And and um, while while I was making it, you know, they had a lot of interviews of him telling me what, how to, what to do. And uh, we made a storyboard, which was incorrect. And he looked at it and he said, you're not correct, sir. And so then we had to do more homework to figure out the things about the Vedas, how, the, how it would work. And it's probably the, the best film that I've, that I've made, I think. Well, I'm, I'm really glad I started asking you stories along this line. Uh, <clears throat> I hope surely you've recorded it somewhere, your story, or somebody's asked you this before. They can spread it either in print form or video form. But it, that's, this is a fascinating story. And it sounds like, to use an old phrase I first heard in Prashanti Helium. First he hooks you, and then he cooks you. And you've been slowly cooked over the decades, haven't you? Well, for a number of years, I did the Callaway golf spots, and I saved about almost a million dollars. And, um, I, you know, there's there's something in Jungian um, psychology called inflation. <laughs> and it's what happens when a person that's truthfully um, insecure not secure on a on a chronic level with their self-worth but totally insecure on their chronic level with their self-worth and because of the way i'd been raised i wanted to be a movie star i wanted to be i came out to california to be a movie star in in, in 1971 um i came to be uh, an actor and failed at that but i started doing filmmaking and eventually, one point, I got pretty successful at it and saved some money. And that goes to your head, as there's a saying in Hollywood, you start believing in your own PR. Mm -hmm. And you start seeing all these things. I, I was on the cover of magazines and things. And you start thinking, I'm pretty smart, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and you've got all this money and everything. Well, um, Swami... The first time I saw him in 88, we came in, the Hollywood Center came in and sat down and he looked at everybody and then he got to look at me and went, oh, bad boy. Wow. Very bad boy. And I was, you know, I was not living a moral life. I was not living a good life. I was borderline alcoholic. And so, um, What's he going to do with a guy like that, you know? And then I had started getting involved in Swami and claiming to be a devotee. Oh, my gosh. Swami's probably beside himself thinking, what am I going to do with this one, you know? 
<laughs> and so I'll tell you what he did with me. He made me for a while. He made me his cameraman in the ashram. You know, I, were, I ran the camera there and took some videos of Swami. Got, I got to be close because I was the camera guy. So I got to stand up close where he was and everything. Got some wonderful darshans, you know, better than as good as anybody because I was right there. And uh, he put me in the Shanti Bhavan, the place where the VIPs were and everything. So he treated me really good. But I crashed and burned. I lost everything. I lost this blonde girlfriend that I was in love with. I lost my 1961 Porsche Roadster made in Belgium. I lost my airplane. I you lost my airplane? house. I had an airplane, yeah. And I had a, I had a houseboat over in Lake Havasu in the marina. And I would go over there on weekends and spend the weekend on the houseboat. I loved it. It was terrific, you know. And I lost all my money. Oh, boy. I even uh, trying to do this new business, which he said he would bless, you know. I spent a million dollars of my own money. I cashed in my mother's 100000 that she left me when she died. My Aunt Clara died and left me a hundred grand. I cashed in my director's guild pension and I spent every penny that I've ever that I ever had to get this business going and it failed. And I even borrowed five hundred thousand on my credit cards and credit lines and defaulted on that. And I got to the point where I literally went down to the washing machine to wash my laundry and I didn't have the coins to wash my laundry. Holy and three God. times I had a notice on my apartment door, pay the rent or get out. And I'd already borrowed money from friends and everything. And I didn't have any, didn't, I thought I was going to be homeless. And I started thinking where, where can I park the car? I can sleep in the car and maybe I can go to the gym and take a shower I was trying to figure out how I was going to live being homeless because I didn't have any money and I'd already borrowed money, borrowed money from everybody. I borrowed $800 from, from uh, my, <laughs> Michael Congleton, you know. I mean, everybody, I was broke and uh, I couldn't get work. And so what Swami had to do was make me into a beggar. And I mean, I'm to the point where you're glad to have a biscuit. I used to have $500 dinners and take people out and have a wonderful time, you know. And so uh, in order to cure me, he had to beat me down to nothing, to a beggar. At the same time, though, I went around the world. I went to 26 countries filming Psy schools, Psy service, Psy medical camps, uh, meeting all the devotees, speaking in foreign countries as a honored guest and staying with the richest people in those countries and they're as guests of their home and everything and being treated like a king in all these places. At the same time, I was getting to see the work that Swami was doing around the world. So um, the combination of beating me down and showing me how to spend your money. People built temples and things with their money and did wonderful, you know, if you go to Nairobi, to the Sci Center there, they've got a medical clinic in the Sci Center. It's a huge thing. They built a stupa in the parking lot. And you see the people that are wealthy using their money properly and feeding people with their money instead of feeding yourself fancy meals, you know? And so that combination of beating you down to a beggar, and at the same time showing you how to live and being treated well by the devotees and and treated like a VIP, which I call a very irritating person, by the way, <laughs> but being treated like an honored guest by all the devotees, it changed me uh, into a different person. So I am a product of his process. Um, I, I'm I'm a work in process. I'm, don't don't misunderstand me, but what it's all about is that transformation. So usually, whenever I talk somewhere, I talk about transformation and how service will will change you. And uh, I use examples of people that I know that have been changed by their service. There was a guy in Miami who was a corporate raider. This is one of my favorite stories. He was a corporate raider, which means he would go buy companies and pilfer them he would get the 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 
majority shareholder position and get on the board. And he would sell pieces of the company off and rob all the stuff out of the company and then sell it off. He even took people's pensions. Hmm. You can imagine that. Imagine going into a company and taking all the money that the people have worked for to get their pension and taking that money and getting it, keeping it yourself. Well, kind of a bad dude. Well, he got caught and he got a famous Miami lawyer. And that lawyer and he went to the, before the judge. And the judge says, Victor, since you since you're 82, we're going to give you community service. Oh, thank you, Your Honor. Oh, wait a minute. Eight hours a day, seven days a week, and the first day you miss, you're going to federal penitentiary. Wow. And so all of a sudden, this billionaire who was a corporate raider stealing people's pensions is in a food line feeding people. Thank you, sir. I haven't eaten anything in three days. God bless you. Such a good man for being here feeding me. Thank you so much. With people with tears in their eyes, thanking him for feeding them. And it changed him. He became a different man because the, from the service. And so that kind of a service um, can change you because you become very you know, I'll tell us one of my favorite experiences that I've told in some of my talks is, is I was getting gas one day at a gas station and a guy comes up to me with a handful of corroded batteries. And he says, sir, you want to buy any batteries? And I looked at him and I said, are you hungry? And he said, man, I'm so hungry. I hadn't had anything to eat in three days. And so I looked around, there was a Mexican fast food place across the street. I said, if you go over there, as soon as I finish with the gas, I'm going to come over there and buy you something to eat. And I remember him walking across the street, looking back at me like, are you really going to come over there? You know, and I did. I went over there and when I took him inside and there's a big menu, I said, get anything you want. You know, I won't buy any alcohol, but you can have anything you want up there. And he got a couple of burritos and a Coke and everything. And he came out and he sat down on the curb and I came out and sat down beside him. And he started crying, real tough guy. And he explained to me he'd been in prison and he just got out and he didn't have any money. And I started crying. <laughs> makes, me, makes me almost want to cry now thinking about it. But the point is, you can't do that without it changing your heart. See, because that kind of experience, that exchange of compassion, is what Swami's all about. Yeah. And so by seeing things like that, it changes you. And so by coming into Swami's world, you can become a better person, regardless of what you've done. Regardless of what you, I was a bad boy, you know. And regardless of what you've done, he brings you in and lets you change. You know, because he is such great love. Uh, and it's not the kind of love like your mother patting you on the back. It's a different kind of love. It's a divine love that you know there's, there's a force in the universe that cares for you. And I've had things happen where I didn't have any money. I didn't know what I was going to do. And um, some, some money would come in, you know. And the time that I didn't have any, the time that I didn't have any laundry money, you know. I went in my drawer and I found some rupees from the last trip to India <laughs> and I took it up to the bank and I got 20 bucks, you know, and I uh, was able to wash my clothes. But to make a long story short, it's all about that, his process. It's not about washing his form. It's not about singing budgeons, although that's nice, you know, it's not about the ritual and the, you know, the services and things like that. It's it's about changing your heart and giving you the opportunity to do that through service. And so that's that's the process that, that I'm going through and been going through and still going through is being involved with Sai Baba and having the opportunity to change my own heart. You know, that's what it's all about.
I wonder if it works that way without having been put to the ringer. I mean, he reduced you to rubble, to, to ashes, and that can be a catalyst that can go either way. You can become quite angry. quite. Well, busy. it's like an alcoholic. Most of the time, they don't change until they wake up in the gutter. Yeah. As long as they're functioning, you know, yeah. there, are a lot of, there are a lot of functioning alcoholics. Yeah. And as long as you're functioning, you say, well, I'm okay. I'm, I'll be all right. You know, I'm just having a little drink. <laughs> right. uh, you can see by the interview, and I've noticed this before, uh, being with you, um, Baba, somewhere along the line, gifted you uh, a, a wonderful ornament that you wear to this day on your hand. I, I couldn't help but notice it at the beginning of this interview. Want to want to lift it up and show it and tell us a story about how that came to you? Well, I never wore a ring before. Now I got two. I got a wedding ring and a, and a gold ring. <laughs> This is my father's wedding ring, by the way. No kidding. Yes, my wow. father died, and my wife is wearing his wife's wedding ring. Whoa, and, that's great. And, and uh, I, I should tell you the story. I'll tell you about this ring in a second, but I should tell you the story about my wife. You're going to get, get a really get a cast out of this. She was my girlfriend, 1982, 1983. Really? And she wanted to live together. And I didn't know about that. I've lived in a single apartment, you know, and I didn't know about how are we going to live together, you know. And so I said, well, I don't know about, I don't, I, if everything's fine the way it is, I don't want to live together. She left me. She broke up with me. And uh, 37 years later, she calls me up. And I said, did you change your mind? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't really say it. <laughs> she calls me up. It says, remember me? I said, of course I remember you. And um, she had been married for 18 years and her husband died. And uh, she had been through very big, diff great difficulties. We had both been through difficulties in the past and we were both coming out of it. And it was a time of COVID. And I went up to see her in Santa Inez, and I thought, this is a wonder. She lived about 90 minutes, two hours from here. I went up to see her, and I thought, this is a wonderful girl, you know. Six weeks later, I asked her to marry me. Yeah. And so, and I've never been married, you know. I'm, I'm, so I was 72 at the time, and I've never been married. Wow. So that was my, fir my first marriage at 72, and... I tell everybody she's a wonderful girl. I don't care what anybody says. <laughs> and she, she she laughs at my jokes, you know. And so we get along wonderfully. Um, and so, hey, Karen, come here a second. I want you to see her. This is hey, you're a part of the story, and you've got to give your this two. This is Karen. She's a wonderful girl, but this is my moment of glory. I know. You? I know. <laughs> you love these talks. Yeah. Anyway, I'm gonna go. Anyway, she's a wonderful girl. And, you know, years ago, I told somebody, I'm well, I, and now you got to know, I had given Swami a bunch of letters asking for a wife. And in February of 2000, I, came, I got an interview in the private interview room, you know, with, and I'm, I'm sitting there looking at him. And out of the blue, without me saying anything, he says, don't get married. <sighs> don't get married. I said, Swami, um, I, I want a wife. I don't want to be alone the rest of my life. This is February 2000. And he says, 23 hours and 55 minutes of troubles for five minutes of pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he said. <laughs> and so then, then he looked at me and he, and he, he wrote, he wrote in the air like he does. Yeah. He says, I have a very good wife for you. Mm. 22 years later or 21 years later, we got back together. Uh, Karen and I got married. That's a miracle. So, uh, and I tell her every day, and I think she'll validate this. I tell her every day, you're a gift from God. Yeah, yeah. Because she is, she's actually a better person than I am. And, <laughs> And she's not, she doesn't claim to be a devotee, but she practices everything that Swami says, you know, she doesn't, 
believe in worshiping a form, yeah. you know, but she worships the super consciousness, the paramatma, the formless, which is what Swami really is. That's his and so we get along really well in that regard. And she's not resistant to anything. She's nothing to say, you know, she, she comes to budgeons once in a while, you know, and she thinks, you know, you go and things like that. So, and I, and a lot of our devotees in our center, their mates don't come anyway. Yo. You know, there's a lot of people that don't, that you have a couple and then they don't, you know, you go ahead, honey. And no, I'm, I'm okay. There's, you know, actually, but, there's actually friction between mates yeah uh, over whether or not sai baba has a role in the other mates oh and yeah the, they sometimes resent the, the amount of time that you spend in the center and stuff like that with swami if they're not a follower and some people you know like karin hasn't had the opportunity of meeting swami and knowing who he is neither did i until i met him yeah and until i saw his work right you know it says in the bible you will know him by his works mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. And you, you, know, you probably know the meaning of that more so, I'm just going to hazard a guess here, than any other devotee alive since you've been all over the world seeing his works manifest in person. Uh, probably, that, that's probably true. And I say that without ego because he, no, needed, he needed to do that to fix me. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I got to send this guy all over creation or I'm not, it's not going to work. <laughs> well, two things before we go on, because I want to get back to the story I asked you about uh, Baba's materializing a ring for you. Oh, yeah. Uh, that story. And then maybe show us some of the pictures, some of the videos. Sure. I've got a couple of really good ones that are short that okay. will show you that I was crying when I filmed them. Oh, boy. Boy. I couldn't First believe it. Yeah. Well, it was February 2000. Okay. And I was with my lifelong friend, Carl Hayes, who's passed on now. And uh, I, I said to Carl, I said, Carl, and Carl had, I had been to see Swami before and he was very curious about Swami. So I took him in uh, 98. And then in 2000, I called him and said, Carl, I'm going to go to see Sai Baba. And I think I'm going to get an interview because I'm making a film for him. You want to go with me? And he said, sure. And so, um, Carl, Carl and I both went to see Swami and Carl, uh, he asked, uh, Carl said to him, Swami, can, can I get a ring? <laughs> and Swami said, sure, sure. And he said, and then he turned to me and he said, you want a ring too? And I said, yeah, sure. And so he went like this and there was the ring. He didn't go like this and there's the ring <laughs> and he didn't go like like this and there's the ring he took his hand and he went like this and there was the ring he had nothing in his hand and he went like that and there was that ring and he did the same with carl as a matter of fact carl said something funny in 98 he said i figured out how he's doing the the the, the booty i said what do you mean he said He's not really materializing it, you know. You can't do that. You can't make something out of nothing. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah, I'll tell you how he's doing it. He's got a little bulb under here with the booty in it, and it's got a little tube running down his sleeve. <laughs> and when he goes like this, it pumps the bulb, and then it comes out of the little tube. I said, oh, okay. I said, Carl, you're out of your mind. <laughs> he really is really materializing. I said, if he did that for real, I would come here and I'd stay and I'd never leave because I'd know he's God. So, so when, when the, the moment we showed up in the ashram, we had a special seating because we were going to be making this film. We were three seats from his door and he comes out and, you know, always before I was in the back of the hall taking shits like everybody else. Right. Yeah. <laughs> what, what line are you going to get today? Oh, I hope we'll get number one. <laughs> right. And sitting in the back of the hall for, you know, for 20 years. Well, this time I'm sitting by his door and he comes out of his door and he goes, when did you come? <laughs> you, talk, you talking to me? <laughs> right. And he came over and he walked towards us. And he looked at Carl so sweet and he pulled up his sleeve like this, <laughs> right? To where it's just his bare arm. And he went like this and put the booty into Carl's hand. And Carl went <laughs> <laughs> like that. Boy, you so, got stories. so, you know, 
I've got a lot of great stories, but anyway, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, am, am I blessed? <laughs> you bet I'm blessed. I'm the most yeah. blessed person you ever laid eyes on. Yeah. The places that I've been and the things that I've seen, you can't imagine what I've seen. Let me play one for you now. Okay, good. Because this will give you an idea. Vizag is Vishakapatnam. It's a town on the coast of, of uh, India. As you can see, what they're doing here is they go out and gather homeless from the streets. These are the youth of Vizag. And the first thing they do is feed them because they're, they're always hungry. And they give them a haircut. <laughs> And then they give them a bath. They do. And if you'll notice, they give them a bath in hot water. That's great. <laughs> They've got a thing to warm the water for them. And they also, they give them a manicure, <laughs> right? Amazing. And they put medicine on their sores and things. And this and is they, the they've got a wardrobe. Saver. This is their regular saver. One every Sunday. And they've got a clothes they've cleaned and washed clothes that they've collected. He says he's grateful for receiving a bath, for feeling clean, for these new clothes. He feels like a new man, and he's grateful for this. So, when I was, they were washing the, the, the people there, I actually uh, um, was crying when I was filming that. Well, sure. I mean, I can absolutely see. How now, you may know that in, that in um, 2013, I went to 21 Indian states filming Sai schools, Sai service, Sai orphanages, blind schools, little kids Vedic schools. Um, uh, medical camps all over India, everywhere, all over India. I did not and, know you did that much. Yeah, work. and um, and I'm still working on that film, as a matter of fact. And 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 I know that uh, Mr. Srinivasan, who covered my expenses while I was there traveling around, I wouldn't have the money to go do that myself, but they paid for my expenses traveling around and. And he's unfortunately passed on before I finished the film. And um, it's been eight years now, and I haven't finished it. So I'm thinking that Swami must have something in mind for me to do, to add some more things to it. To, it's probably going to be my, lapse, my life work when I finish it. It's a masterpiece, uh, has the potential to be a masterpiece. Let me show you now one more that you'll find quite interesting. Yes. Sir. This, you know, Jagadishan has said that there are many uh, NGOs in the world, many service organizations in the world. We know the avatar. Shouldn't we be doing things that are exceptional? And I'll tell you a story about this particular place because this particular place um, uh, is a mental hospital. A lot of them would be lying before these before this service in this hospital, mental hospital. They would be lying in their own feces and things like that, and and they would come in and clean them every so often. That's you know, it was just a terrible, terrible thing. So they saw this as a great service. It takes you know about thirty devotees to be able to do it, and they do it every Sunday. And to give you an example how long they've been doing it, the past president of the Hollywood Sci Center did it as a boy. Oh my goodness. And his father was there the day that I filmed. And he said, did you meet my father? And I said, yeah. <laughs> but he himself had been doing it as a boy. That's how many years they've done this. And this is being done by Jagadishan Center. 
he's 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 positively electrifying yeah. is probably the best word for him he can inspire anyone uh, we are in a handicapped home this particular home is catering uh, children and adults who are physically and mentally handicapped centers from Kuala Lumpur come here every Sunday at around midday and we do the following services. We wash the clothes the children are wearing. A group of ladies will be washing these clothes. Though they have a washing machine, they normally what they do is they dump all the clothes into the washing machine without remo removing all the dirt in it or the feces in it. We remove the feces. We wash the clothes, put in, sort of, put in a dis disinfectant, then subsequently we dry it. We clean the beds, we take the mattresses out, we dry them, and we uh, wipe the beds with soap and detergent. We carry all the mattresses out, we dry it, and we, after that we wipe with soap. The first person, one pail, we have soap water, we wipe with soap. Subsequently, we uh, wipe with a disinfectant. This is also done every Sunday. There are about seven or eight devotees involved in this particular activity. The children are taken for a bath. We wash them, we wa especially their hair, because their hair will be all messed up with feces. Shampoo their hair, their bodies. Some of them, they're so crippled. They, there were cases when there were, there were maggots in between the thighs. And some, most of them have sores, I mean, uh, skin problem. We, we will uh, medi uh, give medication after the service. Once they are bathed, we dress them, feed them. Uh, put them back to the beds, talk to them, say a prayer before leaving the place. This is an ongoing affair. We have been doing this for the last 13 years. We need a minimum of at least 25 devotees to do this service. But normally we get somewhere between 30 to 40 devotees turning up for this service. Just absolutely amazing. I, crying, I was crying filming that one too. No kidding. No kidding. There'll be people doing the same thing as they view this. This is very powerful. Uh, I, I, Wilma Bronke's house in Oregon. Or Yes. Uh, have you ever been there? She would have. A I spoke retreat. there three times. She would have a Sai retreat every 4th of July. Yeah, I spoke there with, with Jamsai and Jagadishan and. Yeah. The one up there, I used to love to go up there in the summertime. It'd be wonderful, wonderful experience. Absolutely. I got the interview Jagadish in there with his story. It's absolutely out of this world with zero ego and just full heart and compassion. Well, Jagadish was, his wife died. Uh, and when she died, when they found her, she was in the position of touching his feet. They found her kneeling down in the bathroom like this. She had gone down and, and, and they found her in this position as if she was doing Padma, what do you call it? Um, Padma Skar. Padma Skar, yeah. And um, so they think that Swami had come to her and she had merged in him. She was a great devotee. And Jaga went to see Swami. Um, and um, you know, he said, she's she's with me now. And uh, just because you are a great devotee doesn't mean you won't have difficulties. You know, in this life, you have joy, sorrow, pleasure, pain, night, day. 
you know, it's a dual world. You have both. And um, I've learned that. And it's made me somewhat philosophical when things happen, when bad things happen. I go, it's a bad time, you know. Yeah. And I'm, I can be a little more philosophical now without so much attachment. And I tell my my wife all the time, I said, don't worry about anything. We'll be dead before you know it. Because yeah. <laughs> it goes real Papa fast. We'll take care of both of us. Yeah, that's right. No, and exactly. and I tell when I do talks, they say, you know, what do you recommend? I said, I recommend you think about to young people. I tell them, think about your death. Because you, if this is, I was, I was 19 yesterday, you know, <laughs> it goes of- so fast. Yeah. And so what you want to do to think about is how do you want to leave the world? What do you want to leave it with? You know, that's so important. Fortunately, I've got some films to leave it with to show Swami's work, but it's really all about, you know, what do you, what do you want to say that you did when you, when you die? You, you ate, slept, drank, procreated, had children, bought a house, you know, what do you want to say you did? That's so, that's what it's all about for me. Anyway, you look back on your life. What have you, what have you done now? In my case, I've, I've become a better person. I think, but you really want to think about what do you want to live, leave this world with? Don't talk that way as if it's uh, close to the end for you, because I'm sure it's not. You seem to be the epitome of good health. Um, Well, my wife hopes not because she said, I wish we were, you know, had a few more years. He said, well, we're, we're mid seventies now, Yeah, you know? And so how many more years are you going to live? 10 more years, maybe maybe 15 you're gonna be 90 you know and not only that but you get to a certain point and i mean i've got arthritis i go down to the gym to work out it hurts like hell you know and uh, and we don't have the energy that we have you know we get tired and stuff you know all those things are true but you can still pick up a camera (laughs) yes i and i do (laughs) and i'm still working i have to work i don't we don't have any money i have to work you know but anyway we gotta we gotta work and i'm glad to work what would i do what am i gonna do sit around watch tv you know gene you have the greatest gift of all you have baba and i won't know he's a friend of both of ours i think and you know him he's a medical doctor who's gone through a lot of health uh, crises in his 70s various kinds of cancer treatments and everything else and I was in his home a couple of years ago, right before COVID started, and I asked him how he's coping, meaning how is he staving off depression and how is he keeping the faith and keeping his mind positive? Yeah, Uh, As a medical doctor, I expected some medical medicinal answer. And he says, well, Ted, I'll tell you, I've got my arms always squarely formed right around Sai Baba's feet. Yeah, I'm fine. I'll be fine. And mm-hmm. that helps a lot, having that, not faith, but knowledge and experience of who you are and where you are in the scheme of things. I think you're absolutely right, because I look around and I look and I see, you know, for all these great devotees, there's every single one of them sure getting a lot of trouble and time and, <laughs> and, and bad things happening to them. You know, what's hap- what's wrong here, you know? If you're such a good person and with Swami. And I think what's happened is Swami has brought them close to comfort them. They were going to go through that anyway, and probably worse. Yeah. You know, he's very often tempers our karma. Yeah. Yeah. uh, And makes it bearable. I think you can even temper your own karma as you learn what his lessons are, his most important ones, especially, and work towards that fulfillment. I think that helps to temper your own karma as well. Not that it goes away. It's there for all of us. I don't know of anybody who escapes it, but there are degrees to everything, including that. Hey, I want to tell you that we're already seven minutes over budget, but I'm going to let it go anyway. Uh, I, I'm going to be, I'll beg you to come back for a second interview. Uh, I've thought about doing this over the years. You're a busy guy. And my wife came to me, Jody Cleary, who led me to Baba in the first place, led me to revisit the idea of calling Gene Massey for an interview. I am so pleased that you did that. And Me I'm too. To you, Gene. Me too. I love to talk about Swami. You, I've, I've traveled all over the world. I've spoken most of the parts of the U.S. and many other countries too. And I, there's nothing I love better than talking about Swami, you know. 
Well, you also have the film to talk for you. And I want to make sure people know exactly how to find not just the ones you've shown snippets of here, but other films. They're all on YouTube under your name as Sai Baba. No, Gene Massey plus Satya Sai Baba. Gene Massey plus Satya Sai Baba. Yeah, you do that on a search line and you can see a lot of things. Well, that's just wonderful. Yeah. Anything else you want to say as a parting shot before we sign off? Only that I'm thankful for being here. And thank you, Ted, for your wonderful work. Yeah, You've gone around the world talking to all the devotees and recording their stories. Do you think they want to see these stories 200 years from now? You know what I mean? Well, the, people that, the people that knew Swami personally and got to talk to him yeah. and got to have an interview, don't you think they're going to want to... Every time I do this, involved with this, I say, I hear I hear people screaming at me from 500 years from now. <laughs> if, if only they'd shot with this kind of device, <laughs> then we could make holograms or something. But I mean, what we are doing with this as film as a fellow filmmaker, we're having the opportunity to make things that'll be seen and hear people's stories yeah. 500 years from now. It's it's an awesome responsibility and an awesome honor and i'm glad to be with you in that endeavor thank you and thank keep you going. keep the faith keep that marriage strong keep teaching as you do with every film compassion and love gene thank thanks you. for joining us sairam 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 sir take okay. good care i'll leave you